So apparently I can make all the hardcore space videos I want, but all you lot really want to see is me <laughs> reacting to space memes. So I figured it would be rude not to make a part two. Although last time, some of you realized my diabolical plan of luring you in with the funny space meme and then BAM, hitting you with the science. Boom. Lawyer. All right, let's dive into this meme review and I'll try not to ruin them by making them too educational. <laughs> My partner Sam has picked out all of these memes, so I haven't seen any of them yet. So we're seeing them together for the first time. So let's dive in and look at the first one. Night <laughs> sky on a double day and on any astronaut. So true. Like how many times do you like, you know, you hear someone being like, oh, you have to go out and look for this. Then you look out and it, it's cloudy. Like I remember for the conjunction of Jupiter and Saturn in December of 2020, just gone. Like I was so excited to see them that like, they were coming together like so, so close on the sky. And then on the day that they made their closest approach, it was cloudy. And I remember checking the weather for like the entire week, trying to work out and like arrange all the stuff I had to do for Christmas around the weather so that I could have a chance of seeing Jupiter and Saturn. Like, all right, next one. Oh, cute comment. These are my favorites. We have another one. Nah, too much responsibility. Don't want to end up like Jupiter. <laughs> oh, it's so cute. Look at him. Oh, it's so cute. I love thinking about the like how like the different planets like got their different numbers and different types of moons. So if you think about Mars, Mars has two moons, Phobos and Deimos, and they're captured asteroids, right? They're not even round, they look like potatoes. And then you've got Earth's moon, the moon, right? Which we think was formed in a giant impact hypothesis in the early solar system, right? So the, another planet collided with the very early Earth. The two were pretty much vaporized and then all of that molten rock eventually cooled and coalesced into the moon and it was big enough to go into what we call hydrostatic equilibrium, i.e. its gravity was big enough to make it into a nice round shape on like the potatoes of Mars. And Jupiter, you know, is probably a mix of all of these different scenarios of moons that formed in situ, moons that got captured like asteroids as well. But also like, you know, this is a joke about Jupiter. I don't want to poo poo on the meme, but Jupiter actually doesn't have the most moons in the solar system. We thought it did for a really, really long time. But back in October, 2019, uh, there was a research group that announced that they'd found 20 new moons of Saturn using um, a telescope on Mauna Kea in Hawaii. And I think it upped the numbers. It took the numbers for Saturn, I think it's up to 82, and Jupiter's trailing behind at like 79, if I've got those numbers wrong, but editing back, you'll correct me. So Saturn actually has the most moons in the solar system now, despite not actually being the biggest of planets. So technically, this comet should have Saturn here. And maybe then I would also like it more because Saturn is my favorite planet. Cause it just, it looks the coolest. It has the wings. How can you not love Saturn? All right, next one. Astronomy exam asks age of the universe. <laughs> Big Bang Theory theme song memorized. The whole universe was in a hot dense state and nearly 14 billion years ago expansion started. Wait, <laughs> I mean, yeah, it's burnt on my brain, isn't it? Like, you know, I, nearly 14 billion years as well. It's definitely a good point. Like our best estimate for the age of the universe right now, 13.787 billion years. So nearly 14 billion years. But the funny thing is like, we've got a couple of ways of measuring the age of the universe now, and none of them agree. And they don't agree within the errors either, which makes physicists really start to worry. There's like a billion years difference in our estimate for our different methods of measuring the age of the universe. That's what's been dubbed the crisis in cosmology. I've made a couple of videos on that on this channel before. If you wanna check them out, I'll link them up here and in the cards below. But like, it's not just the Big Bang Theory theme song though, right? Like I also have the galaxy song from Monty Python, like seared into my brain. The sun and you and me and all the stars that we can see are moving at a million miles a day. Like, I don't think I actually know the dimensions of the Milky Way. Like I have to sing that song to remember what they are. Like it's a hundred thousand light years side to side. It bulges in the middle, 15,000 light years thick, but out by us, it's just 3,000 light years wide. <laughs> like I swear, that song got me through my PhD Viber exam. <laughs> all right, that's definitely enough singing for me. What's the next one? I have a feeling this molecular cloud does not like you. <laughs> oh, I love this so much. I mean, I've seen it before. I know this nebula. I think it's part of the much bigger, I think it's the Carina nebula. Let me just, let me just check that. Just, just you know, just wait patiently one second. 
few moments later. Yes, yes, it's part of the Carina Nebula complex and it's known as the Defiant Finger, which I think is a very polite way <laughs> to describe it. It's a few light years long, this thing, and it's a type of nebula called a Bok globule, which I've done a video about before on this channel. I remember using it as an image in the video and just didn't mention it at all. And everyone in the comments was like, whoa, 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 <laughs> what was that? You can't just like drop that in and <laughs> not mention it. But bocule, a, bo well, a boc globule is a, t boc globule is a fun word, isn't it? Like I would pay good money to hear Rowan Atkinson say boc globule. Bob. Anyway, these bot globules are these really dark and really dusty nebula, which is what makes them so dark. The dust blocks the light. And they were discovered by the astronomer Bart Bach back in like the 40s. And he described them as an insect cocoon, which I think is a really good way of describing them because it's where stars are being formed. So where stars are being born, essentially, but we can't see it because of all the dust. So we don't see those brand new stars until essentially all that dust and gas is shed away like like an insect cocoon. Heaviest objects in the universe. The sun, a neutron star, a black hole, and my eyelids while reading the math section of a paper. <laughs> like I feel like this is so niche but I've never read anything more true in my entire life. Like I hardly ever read the method section of a paper. It's just so boring. Like, if I'm reading a scientific paper, I'll read the abstract, which is kind of like the blurb, right? Or the summary. And then if I'm still interested, like I'll look at the figures and like read the captions. <laughs> As I'm saying, I now realize it sounds really bad because it's like, I just look at the pictures, <laughs> but no, I read the figures and, you know, see if that tells sort of like the scientific story and like read the captions. And then if I'm still really interested, I'll then read the discussion section, which sort of like puts all the results like into context text, right, in terms of like the big picture of everything. The only time I'll ever read the method section is if I'm like trying to reproduce something that another like person or another piece of work has done. And then honestly, oh my god, it's just so difficult to read because it's just so dry and boring. And you know what, it's actually even more difficult to write a method section <laughs> because you sound like you're back in like year one again and you're five years old and you're like writing about your weekend because it's just like and then I did this and then I did this and then we did this and then I did this and you just feel so stupid writing it even though it's just it's obviously such an important part of the paper honestly I hate it I hate it so much and you know what I've just realized that Sam probably put this one in there because I was complaining about writing the method section of my latest paper at lunch the other day. So I feel like he's just, he's trolling me with memes on my own channel now, isn't he? That's what he's doing. All right, next one. Oh, uh, XTCD election night. These northern precincts appear red, which probably means they're moving away from us, whereas these blue regions are approaching us. I believe the district may be rotating in space. Like this is super niche as well. I remember this XKCD from last year when the US election was on. And I remember seeing them and thinking the exact same thing because they do look like rotation maps of galaxies that we make. So I'm actually using data the minute that we can make this kind of a map. And like, they do look like that. So I'm gonna get editing Becky to like put in one so you can see it right now. This is what I'm actually talking about. This is the velocity map of one of the galaxies I'm using in my research. Blue areas are the areas of the galaxy that are coming towards you. So the light from them has been blue shifted. It's been Doppler shifted so that the wavelength has been squashed to shorter wavelengths. So you know that it's coming towards you. And the red areas of the galaxy, the ones moving away from you, i.e. their light has been red shifted. It's been Doppler shifted so that it's been stretched out, which is how you know it's moving away from you. Now the galaxy will have this like, you know, overall red shift because of the universe is expanding. And so it appears all the galaxies are moving away from us. But like on top of that, there's this secondary shift that you see for the rest of the galaxy. And so that's how you see the rotation of the galaxy. And by looking at these maps, you can tell if the galaxy has been left like relatively alone and isolated all its life if its rotation is like pretty much like perfect or if that rotation is like really messed up say like the center of it is rotating a completely different direction to the outskirts or if it's just all a mess then you know that that galaxy has like interacted with another galaxy maybe even merged with another galaxy or it's had a flyby that's messed it up or something like that you know that it's not been left alone 
Sorry, I feel like we drifted too far into the educational territory there. I'll reel it back in. We'll see what the next meme is. <laughs> physics and astrophysics someone sent me this one on twitter or instagram uh, i can't remember which one i can't remember who after i made my last space memes video and it's literally one of the best things i've ever seen i've never seen anything more accurate in my entire life like the astrophysics just it is just a bit more flashy you know i often like to describe it as a bit of a gateway science because like you lure people in with all the pretty pictures of galaxies and stars and like all the mind-blowing facts about the universe and then it's like bam they're hooked on science they're doing a physics degree and they're spending their days going through endless reams of equations of tensor maths trying to solve Einstein's theory of general relativity and they think how did I get here and you're like well, <laughs> it was the pretty pictures <laughs> Five to seven billion years from now, when the sun turns into a red giant star and swallows Mercury, Venus, and possibly Earth, Pluto will be like, who's not a planet now? <laughs> it still won't be a planet then. It will still be a dwarf planet. Like, I swear, half of the space memes that you can find on the internet are about how Pluto is not a planet. When will the internet get over this already? It's been 50 years since Pluto was given its proper classification as dwarf planet. And if you're still not convinced, right, Pluto is smaller than the Earth's moon, right? It's like six times less massive than the moon. It's also more like a binary planet because its moon Charon is only half the size of Pluto. So instead of Charon orbiting Pluto, the two orbit a common center of mass that's not even inside of Pluto. It also doesn't orbit in the same plane as the rest of the planets. It's massively inclined just like all of the trans-Neptunian objects that look a lot like Pluto. You know, and if it makes you feel better by reclassifying it, you know, it's like Pluto has found its people. You know, it's found like where it belongs. Or, how I like to think of it, instead of being like the runt of the planets, it's now King of the Dwarves. <laughs> that was so much fun, seriously. If you see any other space memes like on your internet travels and you've got to send them to me on social media, like, you know, distract me from my science research with space memes because I'm always going to want to giggle at them. Now there's no video from me next week so I'm going to take a break over Easter, a break from science research, break from YouTube, just switch off a little bit. But I will be back uh, with my night sky news, my sort of monthly wrap up of everything that's been happening in space news in two weeks time. So I'll see you then. Just before I go, I want to say a big thank you to this week's video sponsor, Brilliant. Brilliant is a website and an app that's built on the principle that you learn best by doing, not by memorizing formula or revising for exams. Just pick a course that you're interested in and get started. Whether that's in science, maths, or computer science, Brilliant has something for everyone. You don't need to worry about getting stuck or making a mistake. You can read explanations to find out more and go at your own pace. So maybe after this video, you wanna know more about space so you can check out their amazing astronomy course. For example, you might wanna know more about what will happen to the sun in five-ish billion years when it runs out of fuel and how that compares to other stars of different sizes. If so, their Stellar Remnants course covers all of the basics. So if that sounds like fun to you and you want to support me and my channel, then head to brilliant.org forward slash Dr. Becky, that's D-R-B-E-C-K-Y, and sign up completely for free. Plus, the first 200 people that go to that link that is linked in the video description down below will get 20% off an annual premium subscription. So head over there and say a big thank you to Brilliant from me. Anyway, they're these, they're these, they're the, they are these. Anyway, anyway, they're the, they are these. Anyway, they are these. Anyway, bonk your... <laughs>